Good morning. morning. Welcome to worship this morning as we gather together. We're happy that we can be together. We'll be in person or online uh, today. So today we're going to talk about being on the move. I mean, the church started out in the first century as a movement uh, that became known first and foremost as the people of the way, which kind of indicating there's movement uh, with this. And the Christianity has never been a sit in one place, contemplate and pray all the time kind of thing. That is important, that's vital as it relates to moving forward. And so we're going to look at Joshua chapter 3 as the people of Israel move forward and let it inspire our church and our personal lives as well as we move forward when we think about graduation or other parts of our lives and certainly as a church as well. So let's stand and begin worship with our opening hymn. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. In peace, let us pray to the Lord. For the peace from above and for our salvation, let us pray to the Lord. For the peace of the whole world, for the well-being of the church of God, 
and for the unity of all. Let us pray to the Lord. For this holy house, and for all who offer here their worship and praise, let us pray to the Lord. Help, save, comfort, and defend us, gracious Lord. Amen. Glory to God in the highest, and peace to his people on earth. God of new life, open to us your spirit, the ways of your spirit as it is at work among us. Shepherd us through this tr transition, keeping our eyes fixed on you, the head of the church, and the one who stills our storms and guides our feet in the way of peace. We ask this in the name of the one in whose name we gather, Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Please be seated. Okay, I'm going to do this again. <laughs> Hello, my name is Nadine Mayle, and I'm here to read the scripture to you today. If you have, need a Bible, we have one in the pew, and if you'd like to take that home with you, you're, it's a, our gift to you. The first reading is from Joshua chapter 3, verses 1 through 17. This can be found on page 334 in your pew Bible. Early in the morning, Joshua and all the Israelites set out from Shittim and went to the Jordan, where they camped before crossing over. After three days, the officers went throughout the camp, giving orders to the people. When you see the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord your God and the Levitical priests carrying it, you are to move out from your positions and follow it. Then you will know which way to go since you have never been that way before. But keep a distance of about 2,000 cubits before you and the ark, between you and the ark. Do not go near it. Joshua told the people, consecrate yourselves, for tomorrow the Lord will be doing amazing things among you. Joshua said to the priests, take up the ark of the covenant and pass on ahead of the people. So they took it up and went ahead of them. And the Lord said to Joshua, Today I will begin to exalt you in the eyes of all Israel, so they may know that I am with you as I was with Moses. Tell the priests who carry the Ark of the Covenant, When you reach the edge of the Jordan's waters, go and stand in the river. Joshua said to the Israelites, 
Come here and listen to the words of the Lord your God. This is how you will know that the living God is among you, and he will certainly drive out before you the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Hivites, the Perizzites, Gergeshites, Amorites, and Jebusites. See, the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord of all the earth will go into the Jordan ahead of you. Now then, choose 12 men from the tribes of Israel, one from each tribe. And as soon as the priests who carry the Ark of the Lord, the Lord of all the earth, set foot in the Jordan, the waters flowing downstream will be cut off and stand up in a, a heap. So when the people broke camp to cross the Jordan, the priests carrying the Ark of the Covenant went ahead of them. Now the flood, the Jordan, is at flood stage all during harvest. Yet as soon as the priests who carried the Ark reached the Jordan and their feet touched the water's edge, the water from upstream stopped flowing. It piled up in a heap a great distance away at a town called Adam in the vicinity of Zarathan while the waters were flowing down to the Sea of Arabah, that is, the Dead Sea, was completely cut off. So the people crossed opposite Jer Jericho. The priests who carried the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord stopped in the middle of the Jordan and stood on dry ground while all Israel passed by until the whole nation had completed the crossing on dry ground. The second reading is taken from Hebrews 12, verses 1 through 2. This can be found on page 1877 in your pew Bible. Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles, and let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of faith. For the joy set before him, he endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand on, of the throne of God. This is the word of our Lord. The Gospel according to St. Matthew, the fifth chapter. Our risen Lord says, You are the salt of the earth, but if the salt loses its saltiness, how can it made, be made salty again? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled underfoot. You are the light of the world. A town built on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on a stand and it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your lights shine before others that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. The Gospel of our Lord. Grace, mercy, and peace to you from God the Father and our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Please be seated. So every, uh, well, in towns across the United States, um, this month, and including last night, uh, graduates were on the move, right? So we went to the Westville North High School graduation last night, but there were a ton of graduations all around. The Gehanna had one yesterday morning and then other schools throughout the day, uh, colleges earlier this month and as the month moved forward. But it's certainly a signaling for those students and those families that something is happening, something is ending, and now something is beginning. They begin with the song, right? And the song signals to us, oh, hey, something's happening. We hear the song. We see the people in robes that they'll never wear again that they had to buy or rent, and hats they'll never wear again. But here they are, and they, we celebrate, they come in, and they stand, they listen to 
I mean, like last night, it was like 20 minutes of words of wisdom. Actually, it's longer than that between this speaker and that speaker and this one and that one. Students and faculty. It was really well done, incredibly well done. Uh, but they left full of lots of wisdom to move forward into their life now. Whatever that is for them. And that's true for graduates and uh, and it's also true for us as a church. And so even in the midst of all the uncertainties of life and the challenges that we looked at last week, um, and, and, you know, and as we think about the unspeakable evil that we experience in, as our, in our country this, this, this week and the week before with innocent people being killed in a grocery store and students in a school, I mean, just unspeakable evil, the church still has a response and the church remains on the move as it has been for 2,000 years. And as God's people have been on the move since the beginning of time. And God has not wanted God's people, whether it be personally for our families or as a church itself, as a corporate life, to be stagnant. To set up camp and just kind of camp out. Because you know what happens with stagnant water? What happens with stagnant water? It gets nasty. It starts to smell. It attracts bugs and those kind of things. And if we just stay stagnant as human beings or as a church, it begins to go the other way, a way we don't want to go. And so today is a reminder that we are all always on the move and uh, we have a mission to accomplish as we've done for many years as a church. We continue that mission into the future. So um, we're going to look at Joshua chapter 3 in particular. We're going to learn two words as we think about and be inspired uh, by their experience as it inspires us, that their experience inspires us. And the first is the word, what we do is we focus. What did the first move for the people of Israel as they were getting ready to move into the promised land finally? I mean, they just were invited to focus. Now think about this for a second. This has been 40 years have been waiting for this. They've been sitting on the east side of the Jordan River for who knows how long. I don't remember how, I don't, we, I don't know the, the timeline of how long they've been there looking at the promised land across the Jordan River. But today's the day that they're going to move. And they're the generation they get to move into freedom. The prom, the, to, to really embrace the promise that was given to them by God through Moses 40 years before. And the, the excitement and the joy of that and maybe some anxious anticipation of what that could be. Because also, they realized, remember what it's, if you heard what it said, uh, it said that the Jordan River was at flood stage. I mean, they could have waited. Maybe it wasn't at flood stage and kind of walked across at an easier time. But they chose, the timing was at flood stage, and so they maybe wondered, how are we going to get across the Jordan River at flood stage? What's that about? I mean, talk about, we, and in those, I know in the first century, when I was in Israel visiting, and uh, the, one of the things about the people in the first century, and I'm sure it's probably, I can imagine it's probably true for the people of Joshua's time, people couldn't swim. There was not swimming lessons. So when you think about the disciples on the boat who are terrified when the storm happens and they think they're going to sink, that story, part of their fear is, if I get dumped out of this boat, I'm done for because I can't swim. So you can imagine the people of Israel looking at a flooded stage of Jordan wondering, well, we can't swim across because I don't know how to... Maybe they don't even know what swimming is. They just know that they're going to not make it so but what joshua guided by the the lord is inviting them to do is to focus on what he invites them to focus on this when you see the ark of the covenant of the lord your god and the priests who are in the levites who are carrying it follow it then you will know which way to go since you've never been this way before you've never been here so who's going to lead the people of Israel? Joshua? Nope. One of the Levites? Or the, one, of the, uh, one of the other tribes of Israel, the leaders of the tribes? Nope. Who's leading the, tribe, the people of Israel into the promised land? 
God himself. The ark was developed by Moses, by God's direction, to be the throne of God in the midst of the people of Israel wandering in the, in the wilderness. It was something the Levites carried all through those decades in the wilderness, that is the desert, after their, their, their escape from slavery in Egypt. And it, it, it contained some key uh, artifacts from Israel's history and also had a throne on it. If you want to go back to Exodus, there's, there's a direct instructions of how to build the ark, what to put on it, and all these things. But it was a representation of God's visible presence in their midst. So now Joshua says, let the ark go in first. And you think the people have always the people have like, this doesn't seem right either, because the ark is gonna get overwhelmed with the water. That doesn't make sense. And yet there's the miracle of the parting of the Red Sea. No, that happened prior to, but now we have a new parting, the parting of the Jordan River, and the ark goes into the midst of the river. Just as God parted the Red Sea, God now parts the and brought the people from slavery into freedom in the Red Sea, God's now moving them from wandering into the promise of a new place, of a new future. But God's leading them, and they've never been this way before. And for us as a congregation, and for any graduate or any person, every, literally everyone in this very moment, we have never been at 11 o'clock in the morning on Sunday, May 29th. If you have, tell us. So give us a warning of what that is. We don't live back to the future, that movie. It's impossible. We only live in the present. The past is a memory, but the future is uncertain. It always is. Every moment, the next five minutes is uncertain. And so even for us, how do we move into the future by God's leading? We heed what Paul writes in Hebrews. He says this, let us fix our eyes on Jesus the author and perfecter of our faith. The only reason you, are, you and I are here in this moment, in this room, worshiping is because of Jesus who rose from the dead, who was crucified and risen. That's the, he's the reason why we gather. We might have sub-reasons why we gather because of X, Y, and Z, but the primary reason is the Holy Spirit has called us together to be in His presence, the risen Christ's presence by the Holy Spirit. So we're no different than the people of Israel who are seeing the Ark of the Covenant, Covenant lead them into the future, a place they've never been before. We are moving to the future, fixing our eyes, not on ourselves, not on our things, but in fixing our eyes on Jesus, who is the one who creates time and creates futures and creates life and is the reason for our being and will part metaphorical waters for us and addresses the challenges that we face who stills the storms that affect us who moves us into those unspeakable times of evil with a response of grace and truth and peace and justice that's what jesus does and he leads us first into it Fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith. Colossians chapter 1, Paul says this about Jesus. Paul says, He, Jesus, is before all things, and in Him all things hold together. He is the head of the body, the church. He is the head of the body. He's like the senior pastor of this church. He is. Because He's the reason why we're all here. And so if that's true, and it is, and if Hebrews is, uh, uh, Hebrews is, uh, Hebrews is, Hebrews, this is true. Let me just say that. Fix our eyes on Jesus. Then we just heed that we're called to focus, just as the people of Israel were called to focus. So we focus and we also consecrate. Consecrate. Joshua said to the people, consecrate yourselves. He said first, the ark's going to go, follow the ark. Then he says, now consecrate yourself. What's it mean to consecrate? You know what that means? It means to be set apart for a purpose. We've got to consecrate this plate 
for a purpose of that purpose, right? We consecrate things. I think last night for graduation and any graduation, there's a moment of consecration, right? It is a consecration-like evening or two hours for a graduate. And it ends with a moment of consecration. You know what it is? The tassel moved from right to left at the very end. And now they're ready to go. Before that, there's still a student at that school. But all of a sudden, now they're not a student at school. Now they are on the move to a new place. And, they're, and that, also that consecration is that time of, stu- of, of, of education. And there is a place where in, this, in the graduation ceremony uh, last night, uh, at least our pr- principal said it, and I'm sure every principal and every college dean says the same thing, that they verified every student. They've, these are all under the laws of our country and our state. And all these students are ready, and we verify they're ready for this moment. And so they can confer diplomas. Now, that's true for graduates, but is it true for also Christians and the church for our personal lives and for our corporate lives? Is that true? Are we consecrated? When do you think that would happen? See, baptism is a consecration, right? Right? It sets us apart. Baptism is a moment where a, a, a ritual given by God himself that sets us apart from everybody else. It doesn't make us better. It doesn't make us anything except that it just makes us different than a person that's not baptized. We use simple water. We put oil on the head. We bless. And then we send out. Jesus said, go make disciples, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. It's God's idea to use this as a moment of consecration to set us apart for a purpose in the world. Every baptized person. It's not taken away. It's once given, and it's always forever. Beautiful that way. Joshua 3, 5, consecrate yourselves for tomorrow the Lord will do amazing things among you. I like that a lot. I want to see amazing things. How about you? Amazing. Jesus said, you are the salt of the earth. You are the light of the world. Jesus is the light of the world. He said that about himself. I am the light of the world. And because we are linked with him, he says the same thing about us. You are the light of the world, he says. You are the salt of the earth. And in some ways, this is a consecration. Consecration bestowing. He didn't ask if we want to be. He didn't say, raise your hand if you want to volunteer to be salt of the earth or the light of the world. Anybody? No, they go, I don't even know what that means, Jesus. He just goes, no, just as God the Father and the Holy Spirit and Jesus himself in the creation spoke and things came into being, in this moment, Jesus the Messiah speaks and that which he speaks comes into being. He says, you are the salt of the earth. I've just said it. It's true, Jesus says. You are the light of the world. And so we move in response to unspeakable tragedies or life itself into the future that is still unknown, focusing on fixing our eyes on Jesus, knowing that as we move into this future, God's entrusting to us, we do so with an identity. As a baptized person filled with the Holy Spirit with a particular role to play in life that is light in the midst of the darkness that keeps creeping in. And if you watch Thursday's video, that Friday morning's video that I put out about this Sunday sermon, I will say it again. The only way darkness is dispelled is when light shows up. When light shows up, darkness goes away. We know that literally to be true. But it's also true when God's people show up. 
I'm not saying it's easy, there's easy answers. There's absolutely not. But for Christians to stay in their building or to stay in their homes and not do anything because of the challenges and the uncertainty or whatever it is, that's not the best use of the church. The church is meant to be light in the darkness. The darkness is not going to give up its role. And light shouldn't either. Because we need light to shine in the darkness of the world. We need salt to flavor the world that is, that is bland, that, is, that needs grace and truth and justice and peace. And so Jesus consecrates us, consecrates us for this purpose. Here's the thing. God was entrusting a future to his people that is a promised land. And he, and he had to prepare them for that, to consecrate them. Because if they don't, the future is too precious to mess up, right? Because they're talking about, this is generations who will live there. For you and I as a church and us in our personal lives, we need to understand that God is entrusting a future to us. The future to our church, the future for our personal lives as well. God will continue to do that because that's what God does. He invites us into a future, but he invites us by saying a similar thing just as the administration said to the graduates. These people are now prepared because I prepared them, God would say. I've done the work. I prepared them for the future. Now, they need to step up and start walking into the future that I'm giving them. Because as Paul says, Jesus is before us. He holds all things together. He is in all things. So, church, are we ready to be on the move? Are you ready? So here's the thing. At the end of this worship service, I'm going to give you a warning. After the last hymn, we're going to be on the move. What we're going to do is, we're all going to walk out those doors and stand outside in the parking lot right there, okay? And we're going to finish worship service right out there, okay? And you're going, Pastor Mike, I don't want to do that. Fine. If you want to sit in here, that's cool. Hey, whatever. But trust me, we're going to walk out after the hymn. We're going to gather up our things, just like the people of Israel had to gather up their things and move on, move forward. We're going to gather up our stuff, and we're going to just... We're going to walk out those doors and stand right outside the front doors, and then we'll end the service out there. Good? Let's pray. Lord, thank you for your movement among us. Thank you for preparing us, equipping us, leading us, loving us to do the work that you want us to do, to be the people you want us to be, to let your life flow through us, to be a blessing to everyone around us. And so we ask that you would continue to lead us and shepherd us in this process. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.
Friends, let us confess our faith with the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, Creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, His only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. On the third day, He rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Let us pray. Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hid, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. Friends, if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, God, who is faithful and just, will forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. You're invited to sit or to kneel for a confession today. Most merciful God, we confess that we are in bondage to sin and cannot free ourselves. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us. Forgive us, renew us, and lead us so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your holy name. Amen. Please stand and hear the good news. Almighty God in his mercy has given his son to die for us and for his sake God forgives us all our sins. As a called and ordained minister in the church of Christ and by his authority, I therefore declare to you the entire forgiveness of all your sins in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. right and salutary that we should at all times and in all places offer thanks and praise to you, O Lord, Holy Father, almighty and ever-living God. But chiefly, we are bound to praise you for the glorious resurrection of our Lord. For he is the true, true Passover lamb who gave himself to take away our sin, who by his death has destroyed death and by his rising has brought us to eternal life. And so with Mary Magdalene and Peter and all the witnesses of the resurrection, with earth and sea and all their creatures, and with angels and archangels, cherubim and seraphim, we praise your name and join their unending hymn.
Blessed are you, O Lord of heaven and earth, in mercy for a fallen world, you gave your only Son, that all who believe in him should not perish but have eternal life. We give you thanks for the salvation you've prepared for us through Jesus Christ. Send now your Holy Spirit into our hearts that we may receive our Lord with a living faith as he comes to us in his Holy, sip, uh, in his holy Supper. In the night in which he betrayed our Lord Jesus, took bread and gave thanks, broke it, and he gave, gave it to his disciples saying, Take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Again, after supper, he took the cup, gave thanks, gave it for all to drink, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this in remembrance of me. We pray as the Lord has taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Friends, Jesus welcomes sinners and eats with them. Come and enjoy and receive this feast as a gift. Please be seated.
The body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ strengthen you and keep you in his grace. Amen. Set free from captivity to sin and death, we pray to the God of resurrection for the church, people in need, and all of creation. Holy God, make your people one as you are one and your, as with your Son. Extend the gifts we've been given by your Spirit to all people, especially those experiencing division or questioning your love. God, in your mercy. We pray to you, Almighty God, in this time of deep loss, grief, and anger, and confusion after the unthinkable shootings in Buffalo and Uvalde, Texas. You are our refuge and our strength, a very present help in time of trouble. Do not let us fail in the face of these events. Uphold us with your love. Give us the strength we need to move forward. Help us in our confusion and guide our actions. Heal the hurt, console the bereaved and afflicted. Bring peace and deliver any who are still in peril. God, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Keep in our minds those who have died in war, both military and civilians. Lord, may we honor them by seeking peaceful solutions to the conflicts that arise among nations and peoples. God, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Grant freedom to all who are overwhelmed by chronic illness, depression, constant worry, or any need. We pray today for Chris Cahill, Sue Chinea, the Dumel family, Marty and Jim Esselstein, Judy Garbin, Douglas Holbrook, the House family, Ray and Jean Mauger, Jean McClure, Andrew Potter, Barb Roll, Jenny Waddell, Brooke Witt, Eli Wood. Open them to receive health and salvation in Christ Jesus through the Spirit's gift of faith. God, in your mercy, hear our prayer. In your mercy, O God, respond to these prayers and renew us by your life-giving spirit through Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. Please be seated. So we have uh, today's graduation recognition Sunday as well, and uh, Greg Osborne is going to come and recognize a couple of graduates that are in our uh, church this morning. And in your bulletin, right, there's the graduates as well. So Greg. So yeah, we have 14, 15 students graduating. Uh, you can see some of their lovely faces up there. Also back on the, there's a board out there that you can look and see their plans, where they graduated from. We have some from college, we have some from high school. And I just want to say thank you as a church family for watching them grow up and supporting them and praying for them. Um, praying for the ministry of St. Luke, the student ministry, it's something that is near and dear to my heart, obviously, <laughs> and I'm grateful that we have a church that supports our students. What I would like to do real quick is do one last time where I get to pray for the students as they send off. So if you are a senior, have graduated, I ask that you would come up with your family, and we are going to pray over you with your family. So, Noah, and we got Noah, I know Samantha is, Stegan is uh, part of the service usually, and I know we got Clanfeth. Uh We got a whole bunch throughout all the services, so, um, but today, Noah, we get to pray for you, so we're going to lay our hands on you and pray for you as a church, um, and just honor you for what you uh, accomplish. Dear Heavenly Father, we lift up Noah to you and all our graduates, Lord, we are so thankful for them, and we just ask that you continue to pour into them, continue to guide them, help them get connected into a church if they're not staying around Columbus. Lord, we ask that you continue to put people in their lives that are going to encourage them, that are going to strengthen them, that are going to guide them in their journey of life, 
and in their journey of faith. We know that graduation is an exciting and can be a very stressful time, and so we just ask for the, a piece of comfort over our graduates and their families to just know that you are with them, Lord, and the St. Luke family is with them as well. We just ask this in your precious name and all of God's people said, amen. So congrats to our 2022 students. Thank you, Greg. All right, so VBS is coming up in July. It's Friday, Saturday, Sunday. Uh, it's called Heyday, Growing in Friendship with Jesus. Registration is now open. There's a QR code. You can actually take your phone from here to do that, or I think there's information in your bulletin. Um, so if you know somebody, uh, want to be part of VBS, or you have kids or grandkids, make sure you register. Registration has started. We're looking forward to it this summer. Aaron McCullough is last Sunday with us is June 26th, and we want to honor his 15 years of service with us. And after the services, um, starting at 11 o'clock in the yard out here, weather permitting, certainly, uh, we'll have ice cream social. And so we just want to celebrate together and celebrate and give thanks for Aaron and all that on that Sunday. So just kind of make plans for that um, on the 26th of June. And the summer lunch program, as many of us know, is beginning June 6th through 10th. We're one of many churches that help out. There's, we've gratefully, there's, we've received a lot of help. Um, what we still need some help with is some, a few days through the week to help serve. So um, I think it's in your bulletin about when that is. Um, yeah. Yeah, on the back of your, on your back of your bulletin, there is information about summer lunch program that's coming up June 6 through 10. And those are the announcements I have today. Good. Let's stand. And we will sing our last hymn. And just a reminder, after our hymn, we're going to gather things up. We're going to walk out those doors together, okay? And we're going to stand outside. Let's sing. Oh, it's right over there, right by that wall. 
little rubber piece right there. Come on out, it's beautiful out here. It's gorgeous. Can't ask for a better day. Yeah. Right? Come on, we'll got room. There you go, right. I wish we could do church outside. Yeah. That's nice. Boy, we had, we did during the pandemic, but yeah. All right, remember our Lord's words. Uh, he said to the disciples, he says to us, Go, I'm sending you out like sheep among wolves. Right? We're on the move. This, right? Everyone around, these apartment buildings, people across the street, all through Guyana, this part of... You are salt of the earth. You are the light. Be salt and light here because the world desperately needs salt and light today. Amen? Amen. Now, here's the benediction. Let nothing disturb you. Things are passing. God never changes. Patient endurance attains all things whom God possesses. Alone God suffices. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Friends, go in peace. Live by faith. Thanks be to God. And feel free to hang out, get some coffee, or go to your cars, whatever. <laughs> We're so happy. God bless. Yeah.